So far away, Nisha. Favourite Forrest Gump moment? I really like it when he goes on a very long run for about three years. Yeah. I, know, I feel like sometimes we all just need to take three fucking years off. That'd be great, wouldn't it? Imagine just being like, you know what? Fuck this, three years off. Done. <laughs> Forrest Gump is a feel-good movie from the 90s in which a mentally deficient man's childhood sweetheart dies of AIDS. So that's it. That is a really bad, like, fucking hell. <laughs> Forrest Gump, it's a feel-good movie. Life is like a box of chocolates. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's not a feel good. That, how many of Forrest Gump's close friends and family fucking die in that movie? Adapted from a novel with the same name, Paramount Pictures very famously screwed over the author of that book, Winston Groom, when it came to royalties. A gesture he reportedly returned by penning a sequel so batshit insane it would be impossible to adapt a film, and then making them buy it. So what's this about getting screwed over with royalties? Well, when Winston Groom sold the rights to Forrest Gump, um, to Paramount Pictures were reported $350,000. He was promised 3% of the film's total net profits on top of that um, when the film eventually got made. If anyone out there who doesn't have the box office numbers for Forrest Gump memorised or in front of them like I do on a page, um, Forrest Gump made about $600 million, so about $1.2, $1.1 billion adjusted for inflation on a budget of about $55 million or $100 to $110 million um, today. So you might be thinking, well, that sounds like a pretty big payday for Mr. Winston Groom because 3% of almost half a billion fucking dollars um, sounds pretty sweet, but here's the thing, on paper, Forrest Gump actually lost money. Wait, so how does something that made half a billion dollars lose money? Uh, well, that's due to a wonderfully frustrating concept known as Hollywood accounting, which I've written about in more detail for Today I Found Out, and you can find a link to a video presented by Mr. Simon Whistler discussing that more in depth. But the short version is Hollywood accounting is the colloquial name given to a very creative way of cooking the books on movie productions to ensure that they always lose money. And in regards to Forrest Gump, um, despite making over half a billion dollars at the box office, due to Hollywood accounting, um, the movie was technically a loss on paper. And as such, Winston Groom wasn't entitled to a penny. Well, that's definitely bullshit. Uh, it is, yes. And um, some of the biggest films of all time are technically losses on paper, thanks to Hollywood accounting. Uh, for example, Star Wars. Um, was um, a horrible loss, according to the producers. And there's a great, I guess, like great, for lack of a better term, story told by Darth Vader actor David Prowse, who was told that he was entitled to a percentage of the net profits of the first Star Wars movie. And he said that every single year for 40 years, he would get a letter from Lucasfilm telling him that the most profitable successful film of all time hadn't technically made any money yet so he wasn't entitled to anything. Um, all the actors from The Lord of the Rings who were promised a percentage of merchandise sales um, which never materialised because again the film was a, I think the term used by New Line Cinema is catastrophic loss for the studio despite what? Lord of the Rings being the biggest shit ever. And Hollywood accounting is one of those open secrets in the industry everyone's kind of aware of. And um, There's a, a great quote, I think it's Eddie Murphy who says that uh, net points don't fucking get them because they will always find a way to make sure the movie loses money. So you will never be in, like you'll never get paid out. And he calls net points monkey points, I think it is. And he says go for the gross, which is money that the movie makes before expenses are deducted. <laughs> As you might imagine, Winston Groom was none too happy about being screwed out of money he was owed. And because Forrest Gump was so popular, like the story about him being annoyed about this gained a lot of traction and Paramount Pictures were put under a lot of pressure to, you know, fucking pay him. And if whoever edits this can track down any articles from the time, like they are dripping with sarcasm when uh, recounting this story. Like a choice quote that sticks out in my mind is, Winston Groom is fighting in court today, um, challenging Paramount Pictures' assertion that the most successful movie of the year didn't make money. <laughs> And it's like, like, it's so obvious what you're doing, just fucking pay groom. Yeah, I can't believe that, that's so shit. It's also as well, really fucking obvious what you're doing. And um, as mentioned, like the story of Winston Groom gained a lot of traction and Paramount Pictures were very keen to avoid all the negative press of not paying the original author what he was owed because nothing's gonna put a dampener on the success of your film like the author of the book it's based on calling you a bunch of knobheads. So, um, 
they settled with Winston Groom out of court for an undisclosed amount. And mysteriously, after Winston Groom received by all accounts a very sizable payout from Paramount Pictures, he suddenly stopped shitting on Forrest Gump and claimed that the whole thing was one big misunderstanding. Okay, so what's this got to do with the Forrest Gump sequel? Well, part of the deal that Paramount Pictures eventually struck with Winston Groom to get him to stop publicly shitting on them, ripping him off, um, was that they would buy the rights to the sequel to Forrest Gump, Gump and Co. And while the exact amount of money Paramount cut a check for to buy the sequel from Groom isn't known, a commonly touted figure says it was about seven figures. So quite a bit of money, quite a decent payday, all things considered, eh? Yeah, that's definitely a good chunk. Yeah, and this is where the story gets kind of interesting. So what makes this interesting? Well, for a start, Nisha, did you know that there is a sequel to Forrest Gump? Nope, I had no idea. Yeah, well, that might have a lot to do with the fact that the sequel is fucking insane. And just for context, I'd like to point out that this book was written around the time Winston Groom was arguing with Paramount Pictures in court over his royalties that he was owed. And folks at home, I'd just like to keep that piece of information in your mind for the duration of this video. So is it fair to say he was pretty mad at Paramount when he wrote this book? Well, I think that's fair, yes, Nisha, because the book Gump & Co is written from the perspective of Forrest Gump, and literally the first thing the character writes is, and let's see if we can make this quote right, don't ever let nobody make a movie of your life story. And the book itself contains numerous other jabs at the film. I think that one is the most direct and most obvious at getting across Winston Groom's feelings at the time, where you have the character himself saying, I am upset that this film got made. <laughs> yeah, very self-aware. Very self-aware, yes. Just the fact you've got Forrest Gump, the character, saying the movie was bad, I don't like it. And I think he even meets Tom Hanks in the book. Oh, really? <laughs> Yeah, there's like, there's the, the book fucking goes places because like there was a bunch of stuff that was cut from the original novel for being too outlandish, such as Forrest Gump going to space. Also <laughs> in the original novel, Forrest Gump is basically a giant. I think he's like close to seven feet tall or something like that, which is also left out of the film, which is something Forrest Gump himself comments on. And like he has moments where he's encountering people who say quotes from the film at him and he doesn't know what they are. As if to say, oh, it's not accurate, it's not a true retelling of my story. You know, and then reading between the lines, Groom writing that, so, you know, it's not an accurate representation of my book. And there's been a persistent industry rumour that Winston Groom wrote that book purely as a fuck you to Paramount Pictures. And I'm inclined to believe that when the first line of the book is the character of Forrest Gump saying that the movie sucked. Well, the first Forrest Gump film has some insane moments, like he meets the president. Like three and times, yeah. And then he becomes yeah. a ping pong champion. And like I mentioned earlier, he runs a three-year marathon. The hospital's people said it made me look like a duck in water. Whatever that means. He runs a marathon for three years. He's a professional football player. He fights in Vietnam. Like, he's at every historical world event. A reference that may have gone over a couple of people's heads is that he also uncovers the Watergate scandal. Like when he's in the hotel and he reports that people are across with flashlights, like... You might want to send a maintenance man over to that office across the way. The lights are off and they must be looking for a fuse box or something because them flashlights, they're keeping me awake. Yeah, like Forrest Gump the film, there's a lot of outlandish stuff happens in it. So you're probably thinking, Carl, how stupid could this sequel have possibly have been? And like, Nisha, sweet, sweet summer child, you have no <laughs> idea because... In Gump & Co, the first thing that happens is that Gump goes bankrupt. Okay. So, yeah, you know the guy who owned the most successful shrimping business in the world and also had a part stake in Apple? Yeah, he goes bankrupt. And he becomes a dancer to make ends <laughs> meet. And while he's a dancer, he meets Princess Diana. Okay. So, yeah, imagine trying to pull that in a film. Only now, in 2020, with like, the release of the newest season of The Crown, where they've been able to put like Princess Diana in something without people thinking that's really crass. Um, he also fights in the Gulf War, which, well, okay, but he fought in Vietnam. What makes fighting in the Gulf War so stupid? I should mention that he fights in the Gulf War alongside an orangutan he met when he went to space. Wait, what? <laughs> in the Gulf first Forrest Gump book, he goes to space and meets an orangutan. And when he goes to fight in the Gulf War, he meets the orangutan again. And the only image I have in my head thinking about this is just that great shot from like the Rise of the Planet of the Apes movies where you have just Cobra the chimp riding a horse flying two M60s into the air. <laughs> Wait, that's a new crossover. Forrest Gump and Planet of the Apes. 
Oh man, so like, whoever edits this one, if you can, can you please find a way to just put like Forrest Gump on that horse with Cobra? <laughs> but like Nisha, we're not done because in this novel, he also is responsible for the crashing of the Exxon Valdez oil tanker after he commandeers it to try and sail back to America. He invents new coke. And then, as if all of that wasn't ridiculous and convoluted enough, he also inexplicably ends up in the back of the white Bronco during the O.J. Simpson chase. What? <laughs> okay, yeah, that is pretty yeah. insane. And you could read that as Winston Groom just one up in the previous novel, but when you have the context of him being really, really mad at Paramount Pictures and knowing in his head, after the success of Forrest Gump, they probably want to buy the rights to a sequel, you can see him be like, no, I want to make this sequel so fucking stupid, there's no way you can make it into a movie. And if you're inclined to believe that, you could probably also see why Winston Group insisted that in the settlement agreement he reached with Paramount Pictures, they buy the rights to the sequel. Who is <laughs> guaranteed some money then? Yeah, he's guaranteed some money, but I really, really like the idea that he made them buy the rights to a sequel he intentionally wrote to be as stupid as possible. Because there's a, a great quote from Groom himself that I think is just really telling. Uh, because, as I said, he was very, very angry when Paramount Pictures just stiffed him on his royalties. But after a settlement had been reached in which Paramount Pictures agreed to buy the rights to the sequel for a seven-figure sum, Groom was quoted as saying, I'm as happy as a pig in sunshine. Well, I guess that explains why there was never a Forrest Gump 2. Yeah, well, here's the thing, though. Uh, Hollywood, God bless them, they did try to make a sequel to Forrest Gump because Paramount Pictures, they had the rights to the novel, we might as well try. And according to the people who worked on it, there was a completed screenplay, which started literally five minutes after the end of the first film. Joe you know Forrest is sat on the bench as his son goes to school. That was supposed to be where the next film started. Okay. And it was apparently going to include every plot point I just mentioned, but one I saved for now is there was also going to be a moment in that film where Forrest Gump somehow became embroiled in the Oklahoma bombing. And if you're wondering why it matters that this potential film would have invoked a recent terrorist attack for a joke, um, I'd like to just mention now that the completed screenplay for Forrest Gump 2 uh, was put on the desk of a Paramount executive on September 10th, 2001. Oh, no. The day before 9-11. And fair play to Hollywood for realising maybe it's not a good idea to greenlight a film where Forrest Gump um, accidentally bumbles his way into stopping a terrorist attack. And again, I have to clarify that it's just a rumour that Groom wrote this sequel as a fuck you, but holy balls do I want that to be true because it's fucking amazing. So far away, Nisha, what do you think is the most pointless sequel? I think... It got a bit silly with the Shrek films after the second one. Yeah, everything after Shrek 2 is pointless. I think I watched like Shrek the Third once and then never wanted to watch it ever again. No, it, it shouldn't happen with a Shrek film. Like, isn't the fourth one, he meets Rumpelstiltskin. Yeah, and he makes a wish that like, basically wants his old life back without his wife or kids. Right. And it ends up being yeah. the classic case of, oh, be careful what you wish for. You don't know what you've got till it's gone, blah, blah, blah. And then he realises he wants his life back with his wife and kids. I think a little time for myself. It's just 24 tiny little hours. I'm still my own ogre. Yeah, you is. I never needed to ask for anyone's permission before. So why start now, huh? I think it's very telling that the impetus for the plot of Shrek 4 is Shrek wishing that the events of Shrek 3 never happened. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what, is there a more obvious example of that? And there is. And that is every film released after Terminator 2. Because each one of those sequels has just been rendered more and more pointless to the point where the most recent Terminator film, Terminator Dark Fate, makes Terminator 2 pointless. So stupid. Like, they made so many bad sequels that they're now retroactively ruining the good ones. <laughs> so bad! I think another film sequel we didn't need is the Hangover sequels, because the Hangover was good on its own. Oh, yeah. Just leave it. it. It didn't need to be made a sequel to it, and that's when you have that legendary dunk from uh, former President of the United States, Obama, where he's in Between Two Ferns, talking to Zach Galifianakis, and Zach Galifianakis asks him, so, you didn't want to run for a third term then? And Obama's response, no, I felt a third term was pretty pointless. Like a third Hangover movie. Who'd want to watch that? 
<laughs> it's like you just you can't recover from someone like that, can you? It must kind of stink though that you can't run, you know, three times. You no, know, actually, I think it's a good idea. Uh, you know, if I ran a third time, it'd be sort of like doing a third Hangover movie. Didn't really work out very well, did it? <laughs> he just ended that man. Fuck the Terminator sequels, and I love Terminator. We're in my bedroom right now, folks. At home, this is the poster that's just above my bed. It's the Terminator look. It's got a Terminator poster above my bed. And now I look at it and I'm just sad.